Welcome to This Week in Heresy, Episode 70, Hospitality and Sacrifice in a Satru, with our guest via Skype, Alf Herrickstad. Hey Alf, welcome to This Week in Heresy. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, my name is Alf Herrickstad, and I am an Asatru Gothi up here in Washington State. And we have a kindred called Hawk's Heart, about 30 folks, and that's what brings me to your show. Excellent. Yeah, I remember um, you had emailed me, and I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be really cool, because um, there's not a lot of, I mean, I know folks who are heathens, but it just doesn't seem there's like a lot of media stuff out there about heathenry specifically, or at least I haven't run across a whole heck of a lot of it, except the occasional podcast, maybe. And I know you have a podcast, and we could talk about that a little later on. Um, but for the sake of our audience, because I have a very mixed tradition audience, so could you describe what your tradition is? You bet. Um, and <laughs> the thing about heathenry, one of the things about it is uh, you could talk to probably 100 different heathens and get 100 different um, <laughs> versions of of what of what it is, right. and and I go ahead and and keep the the name Asatru simply because it's just a modern term, and in in these modern times, people like to put religions and into you know label them, and but two thousand years ago, there was no name for it; it was just the way it was, and very similar to the Native American traditions. I mean, they didn't have a name for their for their spiritual path. It was just the way life was. It was a part of life and integrated into life. So, but nowadays we call it Asatru. And I tell people it's the indigenous folk way of Northern Europe. Um, for, you know, that's my quick elevator speech about it. But, um... So what that means for for people who don't know anything about what I'm talking about, um, in Northern Europe, primarily from Scandinavia to Iceland, the British Isles, all the way down into Germany, even the top of France over to Russia, um, there was uh, the people that, that migrated to there over the Caucasus, they had a common belief at one time, all of them. And as they all spread out across the land, these common beliefs sort of morphed into local, regional, you know, they're all different, which is still kind of how it is today. Um, my kindred does things that probably other kindreds don't do and vice versa. And that's how it was back then. Um, the, the pantheon that we honor I don't, I, I tend not to use the word worship, but we honor them. And that's the Norse pantheon that most people are familiar with. Odin, Thor, Freya, Freyr, Heimdall, Tyr, Frigg, Sif, all those northern um, gods and goddesses. And um, our typical ritual day consists of three elements, uh, bloat, which is the blessing, the ritual, of uh, feast and sumble. And in addition to that, we, my kindred, uh, we honor the land whites and the Norns as well, who are the three fates that oversee the, the runic forces. Is, is that, was that, uh, good enough? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. You know, like, um, I've had a couple other, um, heathen folks on and, you know, they are very different. Um, I mean, a lot of the same ideas and thoughts and like in and, 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 and actions, but you're right that <laughs> although I guess the same could be pretty much said of uh, witchcraft in general, you know, you know, in my w Wicca tradition, you know, everybody has an idea of what Wicca is and it's all different. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a part of being human and mm -hmm. any group of people over time are going to evolve their own traditions and their own customs that, that suits that group, even though. You know, we're me and another kindred. We may honor the same gods, maybe even in the same time of year, but 
a lot of the other little uh, things are going to be different. And my kindred's a little unique, I think, today because we have our own uh, place, a, a dedicated site where a lot of kindreds are still, you know, from backyard to backyard and or, you know, apartments or right. city parks and things like that. We've established a, a permanent, um, you know, ritual area and it's pretty cool. Oh, that's really cool. That's <laughs> and just a side note. That's kind of like a little dream of mine to establish like a ritual space in a piece of land. But that's a different conversation. <laughs> but um, I, I was curious when, as you were talking, like what got you into Asatru? Well, <clears throat> I'm a Norwegian American, and one thing about Norwegians is that they're they're very proud of being Norwegian. And um, so I grew up. I grew up with that. And so all my life hearing about Norway, hearing about this and that, and as a kid learning about the Vikings and that was cool. And, um, but I was raised as a Christian and, you know, attended a little local church and was really into it. I mean, I was like one of those five day a week church guys. I was actually going to be a preacher. Mm -hmm. And, but then my life kind of, took a turn as life will sometimes. And I became disenchanted, disillusioned with the church itself. And then I kind of turned back to my, uh, former interest of just my heritage. So really my heritage is what led me to Asatru with the advent of computers. You know, it opened up the whole world to me and there I was one day tinking around on a computer and I realized, wow, wait a minute, people are still practicing what my ancestors practiced. And I had to go, I had to go see. And it's funny, my, my very first event that I went to, um, I, I still considered myself a Christian at the time. And I, I justified going to this just for the historical value of it. But once I got there, I was blown away and I, have not been a Christian since I arrived. What is it about the tradition that really attracted you? Besides, besides just your, uh, well, yeah, besides the, just the connection to my ancestors, it was the, the whole philosophy of personal accountability and the fact that I am my deeds I don't, I can't be forgiven for the things I've done. I've already done them. I can't undo them. And for me, that brought a whole different level of accountability into my life. Like I really need to think before I do things because I cannot undo this thing. And there's a, a concept called Orlog, which, um, you know, if you commit a bad act, that that puts like bad or log on you, like a stain sort of. And it takes a long time to get rid of that. And so there's the personal accountability, the connection to my ancestors. And I, I call it the, the religion of common sense because everything about it to me just makes good sense with it. It integrates with life really well for me. Um, I know uh, you probably get the, well, what, I mean, aren't you racist? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad I have an op opportunity to address that. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of uh, people who consider themselves Ossetru or Odinist or, or um, Norse pagan or whatever term they use who tend to be a little on the racist side and there's different <laughs> terminology for it, like folkish, mm -hmm. um, or universalist. See, I cannot find anything in the lore to support hatred or racism towards anybody just because of what their ethnicity is. There's nothing in the lore to support that to me. And if somebody can find it, I'd like to see it because I don't think it's there. 
I don't think our ancestors were really concerned about race very much. They were too busy trying to live. And um, in fact, the lore itself, and, w- and when I talk about the lore, I'm talking about the old, um, the the writings of uh, Snorri Sturluson and because it was an oral tradition that had to be written down at some point. So like in the 12th century, a lot of it got written down by Christian monks. Um, but if anything, to me, the lore supports getting along with people. I mean, you got the Asir and the Vanir, two tribes of gods who they were in a big war, but then they got together and then they intermarry and gods are marrying giants and giants are marrying gods and there's elves and dwarves and everybody's getting along when it suits them. It's more about, it comes down to uh, personalities and character more so than race. So I don't know, I don't understand why people um, are, uh, uh, associate themselves with racism because of this spiritual path. I think they're misinformed and I think they personally, I think it comes out of fear somehow. I mean, they, they have to be afraid of something to hate that aggressively. Yeah. And, and a lot of the, the articles and things that I've read, um, about that, that aspect of racism and, and, and that aspect of with, with the groups of people claiming to be heathen and racist <laughs> is more of like, it, it, it seems to me to come off more as a, oh my God, the white people are going to go away. So we have to claim something that is purely white, you know? Right. And I understand them thinking that they're afraid we're going to get bred out of existence. That's one issue, but to just to use that as a as a justification to hate people and do bad things i don't get that there's nothing in the lore and the the gods themselves weren't didn't give us that example so i intellectually cannot be honest and 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 go that way i mean i i consider myself folkish in a way but a, a different brand of of folkishness um i think all different kinds of people, um, they have their own gods. I mean, uh, the Middle Eastern God we're all familiar with, you know, Yahweh, Islam and Christianity. And then we have our gods in China. They had other gods and, and I've had people of different races come to our events and I have zero problem with it. Now, if I had somebody show up that didn't have a drop of, northern european blood in them i would be curious and i might ask them what is it that makes you want to honor our gods rather than your own and you know i would just be curious about that because well, it just perplexes me but you know they might just say well i just really am drawn to it okay <laughs> well that i mean that would be a i think that's a pretty valid question like Especially, like, it, it would be similar, I think, if someone, like, if a white person was wanting to become a Santero or um, practice voodoo, you know, and, and, and going into African traditions, you know, it would be like, why why are you coming to learn from us? Why are you coming well, to learn this? A good example is <clears throat> around us up here, we have a lot of different Indian tribes, Native American tribes, and there are tons of white people trying to get in on the drum circles and, and, and get in and, and practice this, uh, this native spiritual path. And I've talked to a few of the natives and, and they're, they just kind of shake their heads. Like, what are they doing here? They don't get it. And I don't blame them. Mm-hmm. My theory, why so many people are attracted to it is because it mirrors our original folk way. I mean, it really is similar to kind of how how we did things two thousand years ago, and and if you believe in any ancestral memories or anything like that, I think people are drawn to that, but they don't know we exist, mm-hmm. so they wind up beating down the the natives' doors. <laughs> well, I mean, and 
I'd say if if anybody wants to teach, like if somebody of color wants to teach their tradition to a white person, then you know that's their prerogative. Um, but it's really interesting when when you talk about you know people being drawn to these ways, and I think you know given the way mm, how do I put this, given given the way that Christianity has been going spe- specifically, because it's mostly Christian stuff that is the bulk of our understanding of religion in the U S right. It's a Christian dominated culture. Thank you. Um, you know, and people looking for something, not that, but that still speaks to them with ritual and the drumming and, you know, speaks to their heart. You know, it, it, it doesn't surprise me much that people are seeking other people's traditions because they don't know you know, that's what they've seen. That's what they know. That's what what they think is readily available. <clears throat> yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all either. And when when I see when I've seen the lights turn on in people when they when they realize, wait a minute, I mean, we have our own thing. Just like me when I first discovered it, and when I first encountered um, our our gods and, and you know it just feels like coming home well you know and also what i know of heathenry and you can certainly correct me if i'm wrong is that racism seems to go against um the ideas of hospitality and welcoming the stranger and things like that correct it it does in in my way of thinking there's nothing consistent with racism and and what I believe, you know, one big problem was our old friend Adolf Hitler, who who really bastardized a lot of our symbols and and in in an effort to to raise national pride, which worked, but in the process, I mean, the swastika was a was a was a holy symbol for decades, centuries, and and now. You can't display it. It's a hate symbol now. It's mm-hmm. really sad. And but that's where a lot of I think the this racism began within being associated with with the northern the northern way. But mm-hmm. and um, I know some a lot of this happens in um, a lot of the racist Asatru stuff happens in prisons. Um, what do you? What do you think about that? And well, I have some firsthand experience with that. Uh, not that I was in prison, but <laughs> I was um, doing prison ministry for a while, and there was a, a little kindred had formed in the prison, and so we would go there and hold ritual with them, and and it was it started out kind of okay, but wound up just stopping because there were so many of the guys in there who were just using the the meeting as a a way to pass notes and communicate with people they didn't have access to the rest of the time and there was this overtone of of skinhead nazi and just outright just racism and it's a different culture in prison. Prison is divided up into races, and that's just how it is. Um, you know, um, there's very little going on between different racial groups in prison, and that just really adds like pouring gasoline on the fire. And in fact, I'm I'm helping a guy right now who's in prison. His dad contacted me, and he wanted advice for his son who's incarcerated because he found an Austro kindred. So I'm going to be telling him what to watch out for. And, and, you know, when I was doing that, somebody started, they started hailing different people and I didn't know who they were. Turns out I got home and did some research. They were skinhead guys who were just criminals. They were just bad guys who killed a bunch of people and wound up getting killed in a 
gunfight with police. And I'm like, wow, why would you put your energy there? Mm-hmm. I don't get it. I don't get it because everything I know about this pathway is it builds people up. It makes people better. It, um, I have an obligation to live a good life because I may be born back into my line for one thing. What the things I do now will affect my descendants, of which I may be one. And and also it brings honor to my ancestors, how I live. So for people to, yeah, the whole prison, drug, culture, crime thing, I don't get it. Mm-hmm. That's that's why we stopped doing prison ministry. Yeah. I, I think that's kind of common too because I've, I've heard some other – People like it. It's it's not an easy ministry to do whatsoever. No, and and I started thinking, you know, what what are we even doing here? Um, these guys are criminals. They broke the law. They're they're paying their the price for that. I mean, yeah, it'd be great if I could help a couple of them. And and there was a couple guys in the group that seemed really sincere, and I was sad that I couldn't continue to help those guys, but. Look, at the end of the day, you're living with your consequences of your actions. And it's too bad. I got a cousin, actually, that that got out a while ago, and he wanted to come to the kindred because he got involved in prison. And I told him, not until you and I have a really long conversation, because this is our sacred space, and, and we have families and children and we're very protective of who comes in because you have to be. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and, and it's unfortunate that it has to be that way, but you know, it's, it's, it's also for your own protection. <laughs> yeah. Our, that's our, you know, one of our highest duties is to protect our families and our, and our kin. And that's just what you have to do. It's, nothing has changed in that regard in the last five thousand years. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, so. it's 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 a smart thing because um, you know, I talk a lot about radical inclusion, and um, you know, and people seem to misunderstand inclusion. Like, um, you know, you want people to come to your group. You want, you know, it's it's good for people to come to your group and different people and whatever. But it also doesn't mean that you don't have boundaries and rules for your group. Like you just don't just throw up the door wide and say, everybody can come in. Da, da, da. No. And, and I learned my lesson the hard way because when I first got involved with us, true, it was with the different kindred. Obviously I didn't just start out being in charge. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was just a participant and it was a whole different scene than what we have going now. You know, energy attracts like energy, and um, it was a it was a little crazy at times. And now, um, in order to come to our to one of our events, people have to fill out a questionnaire. We have to review it with the board of directors, and before they're even invited to come as a guest, because we've gone through so much. And and I hate drama. I just mm-hmm. can't deal with it. And and it it doesn't make sense to me. And when we first started, you know, the that original kindred broke up as kindreds will when they get that big. There were like eighty people coming at one yeah. time. And just too many personalities and no um no oversight on anything that was going on. We're lucky nobody got hurt, but, um, so then, so, so we started over and we didn't have the, the, the questionnaire or we didn't have a, a screening system at all initially. And we, we paid the price. We, we, because look, it's a, like we said earlier, it's a Christian dominated society. Mm -hmm. Asatru is not mainstream. Right. It's fringe, so that makes it fringe. And right. as a fringe practice, you're going to attract fringe people. You know, and some of those fringe people are not people you want hanging around your kids. Mm-hmm. And 
we are really a super family centric um, kindred now. And yeah, it's just, that's one of our, our biggest deals is we don't just let anybody who wants to come along. If, if an oath member wants to bring a guest, we let them bring a guest because we trust them to bring, you know, not bring crazy people, but, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's an interesting world. This will be my first year going to Pantheacon. And so mm-hmm. I'm really interested on who I might meet there and, and uh, what kind of interactions I'm able to have down there because I would really like to spread out and communicate with other kindred groups, but you just got to be careful because you don't know, you know, where they're, you know, they could be racist, they could be this or that, or have a drug culture down in there somewhere or whatever. And we're just not about any of that. Yeah. And, you know, and, and pecans had its share of stuff, you know, you know, especially, um, there has been a lot of stuff with um, people of color, people in the people of color suite, um, people of color caucus in the su- their suite. You know, they've had people come by and say pretty crappy things. And I mean, really? I, oh, yeah, there's there's been some of that that has happened. And well, then, I hope I don't see any of that because I'll make them stop. Excellent. That's good to hear. <laughs> um, and then also, you know, we've had a lot about. Um, gender and transgender issues at PantheaCon, and it was, and I was actually thinking about that um, a little earlier when we. Were, I don't remember what we were talking about, but um, it maybe it re- reminded me of the um, temple in Iceland that mm, was built, yeah. which I thought was really cool. And then all of the crap they got from oh, yeah, Amer- but- Americans specifically, and it's just like, especially about um, queer people, and it's just like, what? Yeah. I know. And it, it's embarrassing. And the, but like everything else, it's the, that super loud minority that causes all the ruckus. Most people, I don't think feel that way in the heathen community, but it's that really loud, obnoxious, super minority that get all the press. Um, yeah, that was, that was a tragedy, I think. Here they are in their own country trying to do this. And then it, there's a name for it, Ameritru, instead yeah. of Asatru. It's Ameritru. And, and I was, uh, I think I, I told you in the email, I was in Norway on a reality show. And so as a result of being over there, I met a lot of Norwegian Asatru people. And, and they're just really disgusted with American Ossetru sometimes I, I try to be like an ambassador for it, but it's hard to, it's hard to, to, uh, defend it at times because there's a lot of strange things going on like that. There, the Lord doesn't say anything about, about people being gay or anything. I mean, a couple of the gods themselves, you know, uh, took on the role of the opposite gender a time or two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's it's funny because like, it, it just seems like people don't really th- think about when they're doing a spiritual, the, the spiritual work and it's a lot of internal work and, you know, and they're reading this and they're not, it, it just says, and if there's not something there, it's like, where do these ideas come from? You know, if, if you're, I mean, I mean, it's at least for me in my path, you know, all of the spiritual work that I've been doing for myself, it's m- led me more towards compassion, towards radical inclusion, towards hospitality, and not away from it and not towards hate. And then, and this could be said for just about any tradition because, you know, pagans overall, you know, we have our, we have our sections of people that are fundamentalist, hate, racist, etc. you know, just like every other religion out there. Yeah, and I think it, almost all of that is born out of fear and or ignorance. I mean, ex- all of it, because um, where else could it come from other than fear or ignorance? Um, people are people are afraid of gay people because they don't understand it, and, and it makes them afraid, and, oh, they might try to do something to me or whatever. Yeah. But, um you know, and, and consider, cause 
they don't have those uh, the Ossetru that I know of in Europe. They don't have these same hangups. So, is it an American thing in this Christian dominated culture that we're that we're in, where where being gay is a sin, and you know, and that just carries over? I I see that a lot. Um, within the heathen community, people have a really hard time shedding that Christian cloak that they were raised with. And that, so they, they come into Ossetru and they have little gaps in their brain that they have to fill with something. Okay. So Odin, he's like God, right? And Loki's the devil. And, you know, and they, 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 they fill out all these voids in their head that they were raised with but it doesn't apply. It's a completely different worldview and a completely different way of thinking than, than Christianity is. Um, like most of my family is still Christian around me and we get along well. They still love me. They probably think I'm going to hell, but, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, but they cannot deny, um, you know, the way I live my life. And sometimes it, it surprises them, you know, or like my neighbor across the street, he, cause he knows I'm not Christian. So he thinks I'm, I've got to be a bad guy. So whenever mm-hmm. I do something good, like, like we had a goat that didn't take care of her babies. I brought him in the house and bottle fed him. He's like, wow, that's really nice. Like he was surprised <laughs> I would do something nice, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's uh it's interesting and and i think it it's more of like once you start to know someone you know like somebody that you're afraid of because of x y or z you know because they're queer because they're a different color or because they're a different religion you know it seems like it's easier to accept the other once you've personally heard their story personally been around them and it's like, oh, okay, we're not that, di- we're not quite so different after all, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope I get into a conversation or two about racism down at Pantheacon with racists because it's an indefensible, indefensible position. Mm-hmm. They cannot defend it with the lore. I, I don't know where they're going to go with it. They're, yeah, looking forward to that. As you can tell, I'm... <laughs> I'm I'm not really confrontational, but I'm uh, I I really enjoy it when right prevails. <laughs> mm-hmm. Look, uh, heathenry, Austru, it's it's taken a bad rap here and there, and it's really it's really unfortunate. I mean, the people in my kindred. I mean, it's such a great group of people. I mean. If if you were to just pop in on us on a ritual day, you'd think, wow, there's a bunch of nice people, like, really having a nice day. <laughs> we're, no, we're not just, uh, I mean, we discourage drunkenness as it does in the Hive Mall. I mean, we still drink, but no one is allowed to get stupid drunk. Mm-hmm. Uh, things like that. But, um, like, in my in my you know, everyday mundane life, like at work and stuff, I'm, I'm very open and candid about, about it. I don't lead with that. I don't say, hi, I'm Alf. I'm an Ostrogothian. <laughs> right. I, I just be myself. People get to know me and then they find out that I'm, I'm also true. And that's a whole different conversation then because they already know me and like me. And then if you if you start out like telling them right off the bat, then they've already they're going to form some perceptions about you before they get a chance to know you. Right. I mean, I tend to do that too because like I find it easier in my life to embody what is best of my tradition. Yeah. And you know, and just being myself and being the best Wiccan Christian that I can be. And yeah. that and being the best priest of those traditions that I can be and being the example that I'd want to see <laughs> in my tradition as the best of. Yeah. And I, and, and I think that really helps me be the best ambassador for my traditions as I can. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. Um, and we're, I don't know if, if you'd plan on getting to this or not, but we're one of the few kindreds I know of that does live bloat, live animal sacrifice. Interesting. And um, well, yeah, there's a lot of things uh, that some kindreds do, you know, they dress up like Vikings and they, they're really into the, like, like the SCA aspect of it. <laughs> right, right. We don't do that because we we live in 2016 and we're not Vikings. That's the bottom line. Mm-hmm. We're just not. Viking was a vocation. Right. It's something you did and we're not doing that. So, um, but we still, I mean, we, we drink out of horns. We, we, we have different relics that remind us of our past, but the, some of the traditions like, like sacrifice are really important, I think, but people have gotten away from that in these modern times. One, it's not an agrarian society anymore, so people don't have animals readily available right. all the time. And um, there's a lot of misunderstandings, misconceptions about it. Um, we recently, well, not recently, within the last year, had some people that were coming who who never talk to me about it or anything they just they just left and and decided that the animal sacrifice was a bad thing because mm-hmm. because we could just go to the store and, and get meat but it's not about eating <laughs> that's the thing no, no. it's not about eating at all and when we um have animals for sac we don't do it every time usually like on the solstice equinoxes special events um and these are animals that we raise here from a baby. They're set aside for this purpose and treated extra special and, and well-loved. And they have a fantastic life. And um, they're going to be butchered anyway. It's a farm. Yeah, yeah. So if something's going to be butchered anyway, how much better is it to... Uh, send it off with love and in a ritual and mm-hmm. and we, so we offer their blood and then we share their flesh in a feast with the god of the day and um it's a super powerful thing and i think um our kindred's really been blessed for for keeping that tradition um i just haven't seen any downside and it's really interesting I mean, I grew up on a farm, so I'm kind of used to, you know, slaughter and that kind of thing. But it's an entirely different thing um, doing a live sacrifice because the animal, it's like they know. And I've seen on several occasions the animal offer themselves, Mm -hmm. offer their neck to the blade and don't fight and don't kick. And it's it's really amazing. Um, It's hard to explain or to compare it to with somebody who has never had the opportunity to just see how farms operate and then see how this operates. It's a completely mm-hmm. different, different thing. It's really a beautiful thing. Well, I mean, it's, it's like a lot of other traditions, you know, you've got the, um, halal and you've got kosher and, and, and it's the yeah. same kind of idea. You know, you're, you're making the animal sacred before you eat it and consume it. And you are, you know, you are blessing the animal, you are taking care of the animal with the prayer, with the sacrifice, with the raising of it. And so for me, you know, <laughs> I've never had a problem with animal sacrifice because like, I know where my food comes from. I've done, you know, I've, I've seen animals slaughtered, I've been to farms. And so it's not a problem for me. And I think that kind of sacrifice is done with a lot of love. So it's like, it doesn't squick me out. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, yeah, some people, they, they don't know what, like their first time, they're like kind of nervous and then it happens and then they come up to me and they're like, wow, that was so powerful and amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, out of all the things we can we can offer the gods, I mean, a lot of kindreds, they'll, they'll pour a bottle of meat out in offering. That's an offering. It's not a sacrifice. I mean, if everybody pitched in, it costs 15 bucks. Big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still an offering, and the symbolism of that is completely valid. But 
of all the things we have, the, 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 the soul of an animal, I mean, that's a pretty big offering to make and a big sacrifice. There's often tears because we've grown to love these animals and we're sad to see them go. Mm -hmm. But another, another thing is when you eat meat that's from a store, a lot of times those animals died in fear, in just horrible fear and pain. And, and I, I believe that that, that energy of fear and pain is transferred right through the meat. I mean, these ritual animals, they, they die so fast. They don't even know what happened and they're not afraid and they're not in pain. And if I could, I would only eat ritual meat, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's just not realistic. I just don't have enough animals. <laughs> and right, I eat right. a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I would definitely be down with that. You know, if, if, if I knew that, I could get a supplier of a ready supplier of people that, you know, and, it, you know, if I could always go to the whole market or I could always go kosher, you know, to the kosher market around here, that would be great. But it's just not always practical. Yeah. Yeah. That, or cheap. <laughs> that does wig out a lot of people. And in fact, that's one thing the, the European Ossetru, they're squeamish about it. Um, several of them that I've talked to, they, they're so far removed from it because it's a very, it's become a very secular nation like Norway mm. and Sweden. And when I was, when I was there, I met a lot of them that said they don't believe in anything. And I had an opportunity being on that TV show to, uh, you know, I was hailing Freya and, and, you know, bringing it back. And I've had such good feedback from them thanking me for, for bringing the gods back to, <laughs> to Norway. And <laughs> some, some people, you know, began Ossetru because I was on the show and, you know, so it was a big impact. It was really cool. How did you get on that show? Um, it was, uh, there was an ad on Craigslist, believe it or not. And I answered it and, um, Man, I've always wanted to go back to Norway, and I don't recommend that people go into agreements or pacts with gods or goddesses, But because um, I've seen people do it, and it destroyed their life because they, yeah. they weren't faithful with their end. If you go into a, an agreement with a god, you'd better hold up your end of the bargain, and that's what I did with, with Freya and, um, there's a verse that says, uh, whenever there's a need for prayer, there's a need also for sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the way our gods work. They, if you want something, you better be prepared to give something. And so our agreement consisted of, you know, what she was going to do for me and what I was going to do in return. And some of that was like when I first got to Norway, I was going to hold a ritual right there and return my blood to the soil. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I did that. They filmed it. Um, every time something good happened and Hale and Freya speaking candidly in interviews about uh, my belief system and stuff and just being real open and the final thing was when I made that agreement with her, we had triplet goats born. And I said, and I'll offer you the best of these baby goats. And his name was Oberian. And he wound up not being offered um, until several months after I got back because our agreement continued on after I returned from Norway. Mm -hmm. And when I finally did offer Oberian to Freya, it was probably the most amazing uh, experience I've ever had. I was alone for one thing, and I'd never sacrificed an animal by myself. Mm -hmm. Usually somebody's got to like, you know, hold him or something but I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I knew that was the time to do it. So I went out, there he was, and I, I told him it was time. 
and I'd been telling him his whole life, you're Freya's goat, and telling him what was going to happen and stuff. But I just told him it, it's time now. Turned around and walked towards our, our horde, which is our altar where we do the offering. And he followed me. And I got down on my knee, and he walked right up, put his front legs on the horg, and gave me his neck. And wow. and it was the most peaceful, beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. I've it was amazing. Like he knew exactly what was happening, and it was uh, quite beautiful. But that was the end of that. Concluded my agreement with Freya, and she was very faithful. She got me to Norway. <laughs> wow! And um, I really do credit her influence for uh, the way things happened. Mm -hmm. it, it was just really a whirlwind process. You know, I sent in an application. Next thing you know, they're flying me to Chicago. And next thing you know, I'm headed to Norway. They took me to my family farm while I was there. Oh, where, wow. my where my family immigrated from, where they, where they still live. And uh, yeah, it was an amazing life-altering thing. In fact, I, I found my wife because I was on that show because she was on the season before me. Uh -huh. And that's why I met her. After I got back, I looked her up and met her and fell in love and got married. Oh, very cool. <laughs> Aw. Yay. Well, uh, that's just awesome. <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> yeah, it really was like a fairy tale. Because uh -huh. we, we hadn't ever spoken to each other on face we were friends on facebook like we are with all the former cast members but mm -hmm. i was long haul trucking through la and i just sent her a facebook message asked her if she'd like to have dinner and, and uh yeah we i fell in love instantly it was crazy really weird <laughs> awesome well we're just about out of time so um if people would like to get in touch with you to ask questions what is the best way for them to do so um the best way to get a hold of me probably probably is email mm -hmm. which is alf.thorvald at gmail.com which uh um, gina will have on our show notes yep. and um our kindred does have a website but it is being <laughs> worked on between between my, my day job, the farm, the kindred, and this podcast, I just don't have time. So right. I've, I've got to delegate that. But um, there is a lot of good stuff on there. And that's uh, just www.hawkshearth.com. Mm -hmm. The podcast that I'm doing has a website and a blog, which is um, beingabetterman.com. And that's the name of the podcast, Being a Better Man. Awesome. And it, it's a secular website, so I'm not talking about Ossetru, but I am um, conveying a lot of Ossetru heathen principles. It's really just a podcast devoted to the character of men rather than, you know, what clothes to wear, or what sports to watch and stuff <laughs> like that. It's about mm -hmm. character and being a better man today than we were yesterday. And if we can just keep doing that, our lives will be better. The world will be better. Right. And that uh, website is, oh yeah, beingabettermanpodcast.com. Mm -hmm. I had to throw, I had to make it a long one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm also on iTunes, so you can just do a search, being a better man, and I pop right up. Well, awesome. We have a well. We'll have the links to that and to your kindred's website as well in the show notes. And um, thank you so much for being on. This has been really interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. I hope I, you know, got you enough information. And uh, if you ever need more, just let me know. Will do. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. I'd like to thank Elf for joining us on this week in Heresy. You can subscribe to This Week in Heresy via iTunes, the Stitcher app, or the podcatcher of your choice. You can also financially support this podcast through Patreon.com. Thank you very much for listening, and if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave me a message through Twitter at TWIHpodcast or on ThisWeekinHeresy.com. <laughs>